ceases to amaze me. I keep saying it every single time I stand up here, but the song service in some way, shape, or form is always coinciding with something that the Lord's put on my heart. I actually have two little, two messages today. I would say it that way because maybe the first part is like a little bit of a sermonette uh, that I felt like the Lord just wanted me to mention something and uh, hopefully it'll kind of merge with my overall message. But I think that the title of my overall message would be Mom, no matter what it looked like, it was a success. So today I do have a uh, Mother's Day message, but the first thing that the Lord wanted me to speak of uh, had to do with things that we're going through right now. And so I turned to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 20 through, through 24, and I would call this little sermonette the church of the firstborn. You know, it's amazing to me that the song that she sang said that out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds and with the trumpet call. That's talking about the rapture of the church or at least Jesus returning for his people and returning in victory. Amen. Returning to bring uh, final destruction to the enemies of God and, and talking about the fact that he's coming from Zion. It's talking about the heavenly. Jerusalem and that's what this passage that I put in here just happened to be on look at verse 22 Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 it says but you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the whole to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels so you know Zion is a hill in the city of Jerusalem that is very considered a very holy place connected to the temple of God connected to the city of God. But what we see here in the passage is that there's a heavenly city of Jerusalem and that there's a heavenly holy hill called Zion. Mm -hmm. And that in that place, there is a, uh, a an innumerable company of angels. But look at this, verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So this congregation in this heavenly Jerusalem on this holy hill known as Mount Zion in heaven contains both an innumerable amount of angels, but it also contains the spirits of just men. It's the church of the firstborn, the spirits of just men that have been made perfect. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And so, like I said, you know, the Lord has given me a Mother's Day message, but I felt as though God really put it on my heart. And that I, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was the fact that we can't go to church right now. Right. That the government is telling us for our own good, we can't go to church. The scripture says to forsake not the gathering of the brethren. I've said it before, you know. The book of Romans in chapter 13 says to submit to the authorities that be and that God has allowed authorities to be on earth and that we're caught in the middle of a, of a situation where one entity says this, another entity says that. You know, that, they're, that they're, they're wanting us to put our hope in our faith. I'm not about spreading some virus that's causing problems for, for people. Okay, so take everything that I'm saying with balance, but I will tell you this. Who is our trust supposed to be in? Is our trust supposed to be in government? Mm -hmm. Is our trust supposed to be in a vaccine? Uh, or is our trust supposed to be in Jesus? Amen. You know, because I was even somebody sent me a video the other day with two well-renowned pastors hmm. who were really promoting saying that the vaccine was going to save everybody. You can trust in well, well, I'm just going to tell you who it was. So you can Google it. It was Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland. Mm -hmm. Now. Kenneth Copeland, I got a problem with that because, look, whenever the Pope came out and asked for everybody to come together and to walk in unity as one, he was promoting that. You can do whatever you want with the Pope, but on May 14th, it's my understanding, that it, or 15th, one or the other, is supposed to be asking everybody, the whole world, religiously to come together as one. Can I tell you that that is not God's will, that every religion comes together as one? You can call me a hater if that's what you want to do. I'm not a hater. I'm a lover. I'm a lover of your soul because the love of God in me compels me and constrains strains me and tells me that I have to tell you the truth. And the truth of the matter is, is that since the Tower of Babel and the spirit of Nimrod and the spirit of Babel and the spirit of global unity, a false spirit of peace has been rampant upon the world and trying to bring the world into 
to a place known as a new world order with a new world religion and a one world government. And it's been traveling through the ages. And I'm here to tell you, it is not God's will for everyone to coexist because there's only, if there is, if, if there is a God, there's only one God. And he's a jealous God. And he's the one that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. And if you don't accept him as your Lord and Savior, then there's judgment to be found. And so I have to tell you that I got a problem with that. You know, he's over there praying and he said, you know, all of a sudden he takes authority over the virus and he says, and there will be a vaccine that comes forth and saves everyone. And then the other one is over there saying, you can trust in the vaccine. No, 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 church. I'm here to tell you, can't trust in no shot. You got to trust in Jesus. He is your only shot. He's your only hope. He's the only help that you're going to find. Amen. And so what I'm here to tell you is, is that we're in the midst of a, of a situation we're taught to believe that we're to entrust our lives into the hands of God. And as the people of God, we're taught that we aren't to forsake the gathering of ourselves because it's important that people of like-minded faith in Christ come together and live together and learn together. And remember together that they aren't the only peculiar people on the earth. Amen. Did you know that the Bible says you're a peculiar person? It's not that you're a weirdo. Oh, the world may think you're a weirdo. It actually means... Like it's the idea of a dot with a circle around it in the Greek language. You, you've been you've been encapsulated by the presence of God. You're in Christ. Christ is in you, and that separates you from the world. You are different than the world, church. Child of God, if you are truly born again, you are different than the church. And if you look just like the world, you better question the church that you're in. And you better question the motives and the spirit that's behind that. Because the true God of, of glory that sent his son Jesus. That was altogether different than this world. Light came into the midst of darkness. And he died and the world hated him. And religious religion hated him and, and, and attempted to destroy him. Jesus said, if they hate you, you got to understand that they hated me first. And I'm telling you that there's going to come a day upon this earth that the rest of the world is going to turn on Christianity. The rest of the world is going to turn on Christianity. And instead of calling you a lover, they're going to call you a hater. Right, right. Because you're speaking truth. Right. We're taught that we are peculiar, meaning we aren't like the world. And we're taught that God is a healing God. And we are taught that for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And with all that said, it makes me wonder about some things. And I'm not, listen, sometimes maybe I come across the wrong way, but I'm just saying. Through my years of living for God, I've ran across multiple people that said, you know what? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to church because you know what? My relationship is between me and God. Well, you don't have to do anything other than and if you're an American, you better pay your taxes unless you make yourself own sovereign nation or else you're going to go to prison. <laughs> and, 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 and there's some things that you better do or else you're going to go to prison. But according to the word of God, yes, God's people do gather together. And I understand. And, and, you know, there's a level of truth to that, that that a relationship with God is not about brick and mortar. It's not about a physical building. But at the same time, now that you can't go to church, do you miss it? Right, right. People that love God that do go to church, but many times miss church for whatever reason. Now that you can't, I don't know, I don't want to start lift, listing off a bunch of stuff and make you feel weird, but like very low threshold to miss church. I mean, I know because I myself have done that in the past. D do you miss it now that you can't go? Right. You know, and, and I think about the, the, the great uh, privilege that we have to be able to come together. Like even this right. morning where we got less than 10 because that's the rules right now. But I could feel that there was something different than what I've been feeling all week. I could feel the presence of God show up. There's something about a corporate right, anointing. Right, the Holy right, Spirit right, showed right, up in this yes. place. And you know what my heart for you is, is that we would be able to open these doors up and that you would be able to return to church quickly. Amen. And that things would, that we would be able to, uh, you know, experience the presence of God together. That we would be able to come into communion together because we have a common union. And our common union is Jesus. Amen. And the fact that he died to set us free. So I don't know. Maybe there's some people out there that this hasn't really even affected them as far as their church life. Because they weren't really going to church before. Because they were of the persuasion that, you know what, 
their Christianity wasn't really connected to that local worship because, you know, they could watch their preacher on TV or they could just do whatever it was that they, but that's not true. God wanted God's people to be together because you know what? God's people are a family. That's right. And one of the things that I've learned about a family is, is that there's sometimes people in my family that I haven't always got along with, but I'm supposed to love. And God will allow you to grow in Christ. You know, part of growing is learning things about your own self. Right. And sometimes whenever you're around people that, for whatever reason, get on your nerves, you guess what? If you really tr cry out to the Lord, you know what's going to happen is the Lord's going to show you things about your own self. If you're willing to hear the voice of God, he will show you that there's some things in you. It's not just that person that's getting on your nerves. Lord, help us. Now that I've made the point about the importance of us having freedom to come to church, a more important question is, are you bringing church to where you are? The reason that I ask is because God's presence doesn't live in a building. Amen. It's in the hearts of believers. And I can guarantee you that it's not God's plan or will that his people only show up for church services and not let him live his life through them the rest of the week. The scripture that I read said, welcome to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. An assembly of men whose spirits have been made perfect with God. An assembly of an innumerable host of angels. An assembly made possible because of the blood of the new covenant that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cried out from the ground for vindication and judgment because he was unjustly murdered by his brother Cain. The blood of Jesus cries out for freedom and liberty because he was unjustly slain in your place and in my place. What a beautiful blood. His blood cries out for our forgiveness. His blood cries out and says that if we will believe his spirit will abide in us. He will live in us. He will walk with us. And wherever we go, he will be with us. He won't leave us the way we came in Jesus name. Amen. We used to sing a song in the church. You won't leave the way you came in Jesus name. But I'm here to tell you that if you truly get saved, you're not going to leave the way you came. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what the word church literally means? It means called out ones. The word is ek. means out. Ecclesia. Mm -hmm. It means the called out ones. Have you been called out? Called out of what? Somebody would ask. Called out of the world and into the light. You see, the church is in a building, once again, made of brick and mortar. The church is a vessel. Made clean by the blood of Jesus. The church is God's presence living in people. The church is God's people living Jesus in front of a lost and dying world. The church isn't just people gathering. That's a social function. The church is a body of believers that come together because they have one thing in common. They have believed in faith that Jesus died and rose again to pay the penalty of their sin. Their faith has resulted in the spirit of God in them. And the spirit of God in them speaks to them and tells them specific things. Right. The Spirit of God now living and abiding on the inside of the true believer speaks specific things. You know what some of the stuff the Holy Spirit speaks? The barroom is not your home. Alcohol is not your dream. Drugs can't heal your pain. The psychologist can't heal your hurt. Jesus is those things. The shot is not the answer. Jesus uh, is those things for you. The world will tell you a different story than the world will contradict the word. And the true believer will have to decide what or who they will believe. Will I believe the world or will I believe the word? And sadly, many so-called believers don't even know the word. Instead, they only know the world. So ultimately, that's what makes the church the church. That the spirit of God lives in the body of the believer and not in a man-made building. And that brings me to my message. Judges chapter 16, verse 19. Judges 16, verse 19. How does this bring me to my message? <clears throat> the way that it brings me to my message is because I, I explained to you that the church is Jesus living on the inside of you. The presence of the Lord living on the inside of you. You are the people of God. You are the children of God. And God's presence dwells with you and lives in you. Hallelujah. And wants to use you as a vessel through which he can flow. Through which he can bring deliverance for his people away from the enemy. And that's what we receive in this story of Samson. 
a great judge that was raised up by God, hallelujah, to deliver God's people from their enemy, the Philistines. Listen, the Philistines are a type of the enemy. They had a false god named Dagon who tried to, tried to enslave God's people. But hallelujah, the God of Israel, we remember stories where they put the Ark of the Covenant in the same place as the temple of Dagon. And when it was all said and done, Dagon's arms were falling. He was falling down and broken. His head was broken. The God of this world is not more powerful than the God that we serve. He that is in you, hallelujah, is more powerful than he that is in the world. And God called a man named Samson. But I started off at the very end of the story. It's a sad picture. I'm going to read it to you. Because he didn't even know that the Spirit of God wasn't even with him anymore. It says in Judges 16, 19 through 22. And she made him sleep upon her knees. Talking about that old Delilah. And I'm telling you right now, she's a type of Antichrist. She'll put the spirit of Antichrist. will put you to sleep. Spiritually make you go night night. Take a dodo. And you won't even realize what the enemy's doing to you the whole time. He's just he's getting up her hand on you. She called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. And she said... The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and I will shake myself. And he wist not or he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. How be it the hair of his head began to grow Again, after he was shaven. Again, the, me the, the title of my message this morning was, Mom, no matter how it looked, it was a success. And what we see here is a picture of this mighty man of God. God had great plans for him. God gave him supernatural strength. Do you know that as a child of God, that through your faith in Christ and what Christ did for you at the cross, God allows a supernatural miracle to happen to you spiritually. The old man that was born in sin, born bound by the bondage of the enemy, born bound by the, the bondage that it, you could say the Philistines would have had over his people has allowed through faith in Christ and his death at Calvary for you to die and for that old man born of Adam to die and to be buried with Jesus in the tomb hallelujah and for a new man to be resurrected to newness of life and to be recipient of the power and the strength of God so that you can do what God has called you to do this part of Samson's life describes Tragedy and a departure of the Spirit of God from him. The scripture said he didn't even know that the Spirit of God had left him. What a sad place for such a mighty man of God to be found. You know, every day, year when Mother's Day arrives, preachers put their best foot forward, expecting that they will have their largest crowds of the year. Not so this year. And, and, and sons and daughters perform their annual obligations and attend a church service with their mom to make her happy on this special day of honor. And on this day, we try to forget the realities of life. I'm talking about the preacher. Many preachers do that. We try to forget the horrors of sin and pain. And we pretend that a little feel-good message just for today will be okay. After all, it's Mother's Day. And I've always thought that the reality of many mothers is a reality of pain and heartache. A reality where things probably didn't turn out the way that they expected or had hoped for their child. Right, right. I can tell you that this scene right here that I just read is not what Samson's mom had envisioned for his life. No, right, right. she, like every other mom, hoped for his success and well-being. Yet the last scenes of his life describe the fact that he doesn't even realize that the presence of God has departed from him. The enemy of God has taken his eyes and he can no longer see. The enemy of God has shackled him in bondage and caused him to work like a slave in his kingdom. Where it seems he will never get free and he will never work for God's kingdom again. Mm -hmm. And that's what sin will do in our lives. Uh -huh. That's what sin will do in the lives of our children. What can we do as parents to stop this infection and change the tide of our children's lives? So that they and we will not have to live in misery and bondage and feel the pain that Samson and his mom must have been feeling right here in the midst of this story. Mm -hmm. I can tell you one thing for sure. You cannot stop. 
Listen to me, mom, dad, child of God. You cannot stop another human being from making free will choices with their lives. But as a parent, you can teach them the ways of God. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 22. This is one of the more popular passages when it comes to child rearing. I love this passage of scripture. See, you cannot prevent a person from making an improper free will choice because God gave them a gift called a free will. You can try. You, know, you can try to control that person. Listen to me. We all have control issues, whether we want to believe it or not. And the Lord wants to teach us trust issues instead of control issues. But I'll tell you one thing. You can train your child up in the ways of the Lord. Now, with your definition of training up a child in the ways of the Lord and somebody else's definition of training up the way, child in the ways of the Lord might be two completely different right. things. Right. But this is what the Lord has showed me. Training up a child in the ways of the Lord means to teach them Jesus. Yes. It means to teach them the Word of God. It's my responsibility right. as a parent. Yes, I happen to be a parent that was a pastor. But at the same time, it's my responsibility as a parent to learn the word of the Lord for myself, to make sure that I've got myself connected to a good preacher and a good teacher of the gospel that's going to teach me the truth, whether it makes me feel good or not, whether it tickles. I don't want a preacher that's going to tickle my ears and tell me pleasant words. I want somebody that's going to tell me the truth so that I can grow and understand the ways of God, have the wisdom of God, have the understanding of God so that I can impart those truths to my children and then on them. They will have decisions to make their own free will choices that they will have to make. But look what the word of God says. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I got to tell you, there have been many interpretations to this passage of scripture. But look, train up and weigh are the hinges on which this verse turns. Now, I have to tell you this, that... And many men of God that I have respected and I've had conversations with, even commentators that I've read behind through the years. Somehow in these people's minds, they have extrapolated from the information or taken from the information that this has to do with making sure a child enters into the right vocation or, you know, things like that. And I'm just like, how do you come up with that? Because, see... The words train up literally mean to dedicate or to start. It's the same word used in the Hebrew to describe dedicating the temple or the altar to God. And the word, the way it should go, if we, if we look at the overall context of what the book of Proverbs is teaching, because that's very important. The book of Proverbs is a, is a book written by King Solomon that explains the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God for God's people. This is not it's some secular book. It's, this is not some secular psychology test. You know, they do that nowadays. They have psychology tests that they actually give to people in churches. And you, and you answer these questions and then, boom, they, they spit it out the other side. And they say, oh, you've got a perfect calling to work with children. Or you have a perfect calling to minister to couples because based on these little aspects of your personality, this no, 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 that is a lie. That is a lie. Secular humanistic psychology intermingled with the church. God doesn't need some psychological test or some gifting test in order to tell God's people where they belong. People need to be called by God, by the Holy Ghost, the voice of God, not your pastor. No, the voice of God telling you, explaining to you what he has you, what he desires for you to do. So this is not some vocational Testing? No, this is a book for the people of God, and it explains to them practical concepts on how to walk with God. It's a, it's a book for the God's wisdom, and more specifically, a book that teaches wisdom to help people make practical choices in life on which way to go, that when practice will reflect the attributes of a person who lives for God. That's what this book is about. The thought is that it's the godly parent's responsibility to dedicate or start the life of the child by offering them up to God and starting their life in a direction towards God. You know, it's a very we do a we don't do water baptism in, in you know, in most Protestant churches. I mean, for babies, we don't do baby water baptisms because, first of all, it's not scriptural. There's not one spot in the Bible where any baby was ever baptized. 
Instead, you have an Old Testament passage in the life of Hannah where she dedicated Samuel to the service of God. So we do baby dedications. We baptize people when they're of age and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and then they're baptized into the faith. Amen. It's a, it's a profession of their faith. But de baby dedication is a very important thing. But let me just say something to you, parent, mom, child, dad. Just lifting a baby up to God and saying, I will raise this child unto the Lord. That's not true dedication in a start. No, see, to train up a child in the way that they should go means that you are going to continue to lead and guide them down the pathway to serve God. That you are going to, if you are a true child of God, you are going to ask God to help you to live your life in such a way that it reflects the will of God and not the will of the world. You're going to ask God to do a work in you where you can be a representative of the kingdom and also to impart to them the knowledge of the word of God. So that, so that they will have a clear delineation between the world and the, and the word of God. Between the world and the church. Amen. Amen. You know, there's, there should be no gray area. And, and I realize that not everybody's going to agree with me on this. You know, there was, a, there was a period of time in my life whenever the Lord really got a hold of me that I had to rethink a lot of the decisions that, or, or you know, Danielle and I had to rethink a lot of the decisions that we had made, that we had been trained up in the church. And when it was all said and done, we pretty much felt like we were right in the decisions we had made. We just didn't know why we made the decisions. Like we were told, you know, children ain't going to listen to secular music. And we just, we believed it. And you said, okay, you're not going to listen to secular music. Children aren't going to go to school dances. And we believed it. And uh, we just said, oh, you're not going to go to school dances. Uh, you know, or at least public school dances, whatever the case. I'm trying to think of another one. Oh, children should watch Barney. And we just believed it. But then as time went forward and the Lord got a hold of my heart, I began to think about these things. And I began to say, okay, so why am I telling people this? Why am I, tr what, is this truly training my child up in the way that, I, that they should go? Okay, do I just take other people's information and just regurgitate it through the years. But you know what I began to find out is, is that I began to remember the secular music that I listened to. Come on. And I listened to the message that it was speaking. Right. And basically, I mean, I use this particular verse out of an old song that I used to live. In. Well, I mean, there's all kind of verses out of old rock and roll classical songs that I used to live in. running with the devil. Really? I mean, should I be running with the devil? I'm on a highway to hell. All my friends are going to be there too. Do you think there's going to be a party Is you're eternally burning and your torment is like a smoke rising up into the air? That's, that's a lie from the, from the enemy. Motley Crue sang a song like I'll take another swig of whiskey and jump into the saddle with you. He's promoting drinking whiskey and having illicit sex as though there's nothing to work. No, it's a message from the world that is formulating in your mind that this is normal behavior when it's contrary to the word of God. So you might not like a preacher that's going to tell you that you ought not listen to secular music, but at least I'm going to explain to you why you ought not do it. Because it's a message that's telling you that the word of God isn't true and that the word of the world is true instead and that it's okay. And I'm here to tell you the word God says it's not okay. Amen. And when it comes to the school dance, you do whatever you want with your children. But I'm here to tell you that what the school dance is promoting and preparing them for is a club life later. Come on. Lights are down, the worldly music's playing, and now we're going to socialize and act like we're one with the world. No, I told them, yeah, you can go to the school dance if it's a public dance, and you're going to hand out tracks, and you're going to tell them about Jesus. And they may not have liked it. And you might say, oh, well, I heard some stories. You know, maybe your kids didn't. You can do whatever you want with that. People got free will choices that they're going to make. Right. And I look, Lord knows that I didn't make all the right decisions even after my sister told me about Jesus. Because I made free will choices. But hallelujah, when it was all said and done, God got a hold of me. Lord. Amen. And I'm going to make a decision by the grace of God to live for the Lord. My understanding of the Bible as a whole regarding the raising of a child and whether a successful job was accomplished is based on this thought. You ready? When it's all done, did they live their lives for God? Success in my mind is not did they graduate college with honors or did they graduate college at all? 
Did they start a business and become a self-made millionaire? Did they establish a thriving medical practice? That might mean something to you, but I'm going to be honest with you. None of, I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything, but that is not success when it comes to raising a child. Don't misunderstand me. All those stories intrigue me. I love to hear the tale of the life that describes hard work and success built. I love even more the story that says people ran up on hard times and, and faced difficult circumstances. I was just watching the other day. Hey, y'all ever seen that commercial uh, My Pillow? That that yeah. you know what I'm talking about that My Pillow guy. He wrote a book. I didn't know this. I was just like, man, this dude got rich off a pillow. Come to find out, it says on his book, from crack addict, crack addict to CEO, he tells the story about how Jesus changed his life. Hallelujah! All messed up, jacked up in prison. No more changed his life. I love stories like that. But listen, the true success story isn't found in the fact that he made the best pillow known to man. The true success story is found in the fact that, I don't know if his mama raised him a Christian or not, but, but, but the fact that when, in the end, hallelujah, he gave his heart to Jesus. Yeah. And if all this is true, what I'm telling you, all that worldly success can be viewed through the spectacle of this one passage. You ready? Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And says this, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And so that's my question. Is it worth anything? What is our definition of success, really? What is our definition of success as a parent in raising our children? See, for me, again, I'm going to go back to it like this. In the end, it's good. That, that's when success will be told. Did they die believing in Christ? Did they give up their last breath believing in the Lord? You know, obviously a mother that was older when she gave her heart to the Lord will have some regrets that she didn't serve God sooner so that she could have had more of an impact on her lives of her children when they were younger. But I would say this about a mom who gave her heart to the Lord later in life. Live for Jesus now. Every day from today until the day that you take your last breath, learn who God is through his word and live for him in front of your family every day. Right. Now, I got to tell you something. I got a question. Will they like it? Uh, no, probably not. I'm talking about your adult children. They might like it even less. Some will, some won't. But, but let me ask you this. Did they like the decisions that you made for them whenever their diaper was full of poop and they had snot in their nose? <laughs> And hopefully you didn't let them convince you that your decisions were wrong then. Please don't let them convince you that the decisions that you make for God today are wrong. Live for God. It's really the most important thing that you can offer them. So with regards to Samson, it seems to me that his parents tried to raise him the way that God asked him to. But we also see in Samson's life the truth that he made free will choices that caused him to bring pain into his own life. Let's look at Judges chapter 13. Judges 13, verse 1 through 5. It says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the Philistine, into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of of the Philistines. See, what God asked of Samson's mom was the same thing that God asks moms today. 
raise your child for me. Teach him about me. Separate him from the world for me. God was asking Samson's mom to to dedicate him from the womb according to something called the Nazarite vow that you can learn about in Numbers chapter 6. Now essentially, Numbers chapter 6, the Nazarite vow, describes an adult. It's never, the only reference we have of a child is Samson's life. Because it was something that an adult would do and it was only for a temporary moment. Like a season in their life. Where they would say, I'm going to take the Nazarite vow. And it was really showing that they were desiring to dedicate their life unto the Lord. I guess if I was going to try to give you an illustration for modern times, it'd be kind of like if you chose to do a fast because you wanted to separate yourself even more closely to the Lord. But it's also a type of sanctification for the believer. A person that's desiring to live their life separate from the world and closer to God. So he couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't drink wine or strong drink. He couldn't eat anything unclean. And he could not go near a dead animal or a dead body of any sort. Now the difference between her this story for Na- Samson was that it wasn't Samson's choice. It was it was a choice that was made for him from his birth. God chose this boy. Right. And God made the deal with his mama and said, this is what I need you to do. I need, when the boy is in your womb, I don't want you drinking any strong drink. I don't want you drinking any wine. And when he grows up, I don't want you putting a razor to his head because he's going to be a Nazarite. From the womb. She had to be willing to agree with God regarding God's request for her son. The Nazarite couldn't partake of any great product, not just wine, couldn't eat the grape, couldn't mess with the seed, not even supposed to be buying. And throughout the duration of the vow, the Nazarite couldn't cut his hair, couldn't touch anything having to do with dead bodies. Again, it was a temporary decision made by adults. But in this case, hallelujah, it had to do with a child from birth. She was willing to do that for God because this baby didn't belong to her. I think that's very important for parents to understand, especially moms, especially a mom that might find herself in a situation where she sees her child that looks like that scene that we read about Samson at the end where he's shackled and he's blinded and he's grinding and he's living in bondage. She was barren. She could not even have a child. God gave her this baby. This baby belonged to God. Look at Psalm chapter 127. Psalm 127, verse 3. It says, Lo, children are an inheritance from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. You know, the word, the word heritage is actually in the King James, but it means inheritance. And an inheritance is something that your father entrusts you with. Your physical father oftentimes will entrust you with an inheritance, right? It belonged to him, but he gave it to you. And in this sense, spiritually speaking, your spiritual father, the father in heaven, is trusting you with an inheritance and he's giving you a child to take care of. And it says that the fruit of the womb is his reward. Talking about the Lord. Reward means payment. This is one way that we can repay God. And this is how we do it, by offering our children back to him. This is very important that you understand this. This is so crucial to the kingdom of God. I can remember as I was writing this message, I remembered this verse pop up in my heart and in my head. And I remember the first time the Lord showed it to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is so good. You know how I came up? Because I remembered, sometimes I think my memory is a curse because I remember too much stuff. But I can remember this, this video I watched of this woman. And she was like, how dare these Christians? Send their children to kids camp. Send their children to youth camp. They're indoctrinating these children. They're brainwashing them. They're not even giving them a chance to make a choice. No, they know, ma'am, you're wrong. You don't know the word of God. You don't know the God that we serve because he demands that we teach our children his ways because he is the one true God. Hallelujah. And he formed this earth and he scattered the stars in the sky and he breathed life into a lump of clay and this is his creation and you don't tell him, ma'am. You're the clay. He's the potter and the clay doesn't tell the potter how it's going to be done. And if you're a true child of God, you have a responsibility, child of God, to teach your children in the ways of the Lord. Not to control them, but to teach them and to and to help, help them to learn the ways of God. Look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. This is when God called Abraham out. 
And this is the scripture I remembered when she was saying that in that video. I was like, this is contrary to the word of God, lady. Look at this. This is what God said when he called Abraham. For I know him. Talking about Abraham. God says, I know Abraham for this purpose. Why? That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Do you realize that in the big mind of God, in the big plan of God, God knowing that he would create a nation called Israel out of Abraham, said that I have known him for a purpose. And the purpose is that he would teach his children that he would command his children. Hallelujah. Because they are my inheritance. They are my reward. Hallelujah. And God desires for his people. That's your job, mom. That's your job, dad, to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. See, you do your part and you leave the rest to God. And even if it starts to look bad, keep your trust in him. It's probably one of the harder things to do as a parent. At least that's one of the harder things that I have experienced. Is this concept, releasing your child back to God when the time is right. It's the greatest thing that you can do for them. Because he loves them so much more than you or I could ever love our own children. Point number one to my message would be first wrong step. But before I get to that, if and we're not going to turn there, but in Luke 15, 11 is the story of the prodigal son. And I wrote down some main concepts in that Story. I read it again this morning, but there's a reason that I, there's a main point that I wanted to make when I bring up this first wrong step concept about Samson. Here's five quick points about the prodigal son. Number one, the envious heart of the brother reveals the heart of the Pharisees. I'm talking about things that we get out of here. The envious heart of the brother reveals the heart of the Pharisees. Number two, a life of sinful living will steal from you. It will steal from you and it will bring you to a place of shame. God is the perfect father and he's waiting with open arms to receive you back. But here's the two points that I really wanted to connect you to with the story of Samson. This was the prodigal's choice. He exercised his free will. Right. And the next thing is that the father allowed him to make that choice when he gave him what he asked for. Look at Judges chapter 14 verses 2 and 3. Judges 14 Verses two and three. It says he came up and he told his father and his mother. See, this is right again. Point number one. First wrong step. He came up. He told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now go therefore, get her for me to wife. And then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines. You may not understand this, but the, the concept of uncircumcision means that these people were not in covenant with God. It means that they were different than God. They served a different God. Like I said, Dagon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, he's, and Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. She makes me happy. I just want to be happy. This was the first step in a wrong direction for Samson because the word of God had explicitly taught that the men of Israel were not to intermarry with the women of the world. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3 says it right there. This is what it says. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Talking about those other heathen nations. Talking about those people that don't know me. They don't worship me. They don't serve me. They serve false gods. Listen, this still works for you today, New Testament Christian. You cannot go and unequally yoke yourself with an unbeliever. They serve false gods. What you talking about, preacher? You talking about a statue of Mary or a saint in the yard? That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that they got false gods in their life. Things like drugs, alcohol, a different message from a different place that's trying to and cause their mind to turn away from God. And they, if you yoke up with them, let me tell you something, brother and sister. I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't care how strong I think I am. You, they're going to begin to pull you away from the Lord. And Lord help you if you do connect yourself to that and it wasn't God's will. It will bring destruction on your life. Your walk with God will be hindered because of it. I'm not saying that in the end you won't die a believer. I'm not saying in the end you won't be like the prodigal son and come to your senses and say, oh, Lord, I'd be better off a servant in the house of my father than out here in this pig pen with these 
eaten with these pigs. It says also in the book of 2 Corinthians, for sake of time, I won't turn there, but 6.14, be ye not equally, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And you know, this is so tricky. I don't, this isn't what my message is about. This isn't a, a singles message. This is a mother's message. But hey, let me just say this. I tried to, to teach this to my children also. Whenever they were young, when we tried to teach it to our children, I kept saying this, and I mean, Lord, help us, right? Help me. <laughs> but this was a good concept. You don't want to marry a church boy. You want to marry a man of God. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you want to know that the person that you're interconnecting yourself is a person that truly wants to serve God. Because, listen, if he's just a church boy, he can send you some scripture. You know how many people say they're Christians? 85% of people in America every year, according to the Gallup poll, say they're Christians. These people ain't even saved. I'm not trying to pick on them. Who are you to say? Dude, trust me. When you get saved for real, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And when the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, he starts changing you. And you can't just continue to live like the world around you. And listen, that's, that's the thing is that are you going to connect yourself to a person that wants to live for the Lord? Or are you going to settle and compromise? Lord, help us. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. J J uh, Samson made a, made a wrong choice. He took a step in the wrong direction. And he went after something he wasn't supposed to go to. Now let's look at uh, Judges chapter 14 verses 5 through 7. It says, Then Samson went down with his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. That means a baby goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So what this tells me is, is that Samson's mother and father were walking with him on this journey towards going to get this woman that he demanded to have. You know, at some point in time, you're going to come to a realization in your life, mom, dad. I know this is mom's day. I'm just saying that you're going to realize that no matter what you try to tell your child, they ain't going to listen to you. Whenever, you, whenever a child has a spirit of rebellion in them and they got their head and their heart made up about doing something, good luck with trying to change that. You drive yourself crazy trying to change that. Listen, don't you got to be led by the Lord and every situation is different. But all I'm trying to say is, is this, is that I do believe that his parents tried to raise him the right way. They did not want him to go after this woman. They were walking with him, but guess what? They weren't with him. It says that he didn't tell them about the fact that he killed that lion. They never knew that. And kind of taken from the, the passage that maybe they didn't know he was as close to the vineyards as he was. Because see, that's another thing. He had already taken a step in the wrong direction. And now it's like he's walking towards this vineyard where grapes grow. And he's not supposed to be around any grape product. All I know is this, is that when you start to make a decision in the wrong direction and you start to transgress the word of the Lord, the next thing you know, there's other things that are happening in your life that you're becoming numb to. You're, you're not, the Holy Spirit's not able to convict your heart towards it as much. You can't hear the voice of God. You think that you're still okay when in reality you're not. You're, you're actually cuddling up with sin. You're getting close to it and you don't even realize how bad it is. And that's what's happening in Samson's life. He's taking a step in the wrong direction. He's getting closer and closer towards things that he's not supposed to be close to. And he kills this lion. He, and, 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 and you know, if you find yourself in a place far away from God, stop and consider the first step you made that pulled you into the wrong direction that led you down that path. You might not want to see it because your flesh likes the step that you took. But if you want to see it, he will make sure you do. And he will help you change your mind if you ask him. I added this this morning, this little word that I said right here. If you find yourself far away from God or if you were far away from God in the past after you had been a Christian, stop for a moment because it can be a learning lesson for you. Experiential knowledge, epic gnosis is what it's talked about. The truth of God's word mixed with experience provides a more deeper understanding of the word of God. What I want you to know is this, is this, 
is that if you can remember a time or if right now you are in a place where you know that you are not supposed to be, you need to stop it. You need to ask God, Lord, where did I take the first step in the wrong direction? I guarantee you he will show you. He's already shown you. You just didn't want to hear it. And how do you know, preacher? How do you know so well? Because it's happened to me. And sometimes it still happens to me because our flesh doesn't want to hear the voice of God. Lord, help us. But look, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, and 1 John 1, 9. I'm not going to go there for sake of time. Two concepts right here. One says, repent of your sins, and the refreshing of God will come. The other one says, if we were faithful to confess our sins before God, He will be faithful <clears throat> and just to forgive us. I love those two words. Repent means to change the mind. It means you're heading in a certain direction. God deals with your heart. You turn around and you head back towards where God is. Amen. I love the word for confess right there. I, I, I have taught this to the church many times. And people that have come to the church for a long time probably get tired of it. But I love this word. This is probably my favorite Greek word in the, in the Greek, in the, in the favorite Greek word in the Bible. Hama. We, we sometimes say the word homo because it means same. And logi means say. Where we get the word logos, the word. Same say. I love that word in the Greek. Same say. It's a compound word, homologia. What does it mean? It means to say the same thing that God says. It means his word says one thing. Hallelujah. Don't unequally yoke yourself with an unbeliever. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Don't go walking towards the woman of Timnah. That's what the word of the Lord said. When you took a venture and you took a step out the wrong way, you were already transgressing the word of God. And you thought that you knew the word of the Lord. You thought you were so close to God. I thought I was so close to God. Yet we knew it and we still went in the wrong direction. And now we wonder why we're like the prodigal over there. Why? Why is it such a mess? Because we created it with our own free will choice. But if we will repent, change the mind, hallelujah, and confess, say the same thing that God says according to his word. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, and he will restore us on the right path. Lord, help us. He took a wrong step. That was point number one. Point number two, Judges 14, verse 8. This is point number two, sin is like a virus and it loves to spread and affect others. Verse eight, after a time he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Here he goes again. You're not supposed to marry around dead stuff, Samson. You're not supposed to marry people that don't believe like you. You're not supposed to be nowhere near no grapes and you're not supposed to be nowhere near no dead body. And here you go to the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Isn't that just like sin? Some look so sweet. Gotta have it. Gotta taste it. Gotta get a little bit of that. And then when I go to get it, the end result is that it's like, it's death. This thing was inside of death. That's exactly what sin does. Sin cloaks itself in honey. and it makes itself look pretty and sweet and tasteful. But the reality of it is, is that the fruit of it is death. He took thereof in his hands and he went on eating and he came to his father and his mother and he gave to them and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. Just like a virus. Sin's never happy alone. The enemy wants to use people as vessels to spread his infection, his virus and his poison to infect other people. This is a side note right here. Sin will always promise to be sweet, but its true fruit is death. Furthermore, sin will always want to spread from one to another. In other words, when someone you know starts sinking, sooner or later they will be trying to pull you in with them. Right. Where we started is that the result of Samson's sin choices had blinded him. Sin had bound him in shackles and he was in bondage and working as a slave. What a horrendous picture this would have been for Samson's mom to see. I just try to imagine things. According to the word, I mean, I'm putting some thought into this. I'm creating a narrative that's not really written in the text. His name means sunlight, by the way. Samson means sunlight. I can see her. She remembers him running through the fields with his long, flowing hair. It's a little boy. He runs faster than a deer. She remembers the time that she needed something moved. Daddy couldn't even move it, but Samson was able to move it as a young boy. 
Uh, the picture of God's strength every day before her eyes, so much promise, and now he's blinded, blinded, and he's grinding at the wheel. But you know what's beautiful? Samson remembers God in the end. Hallelujah. Samson remembers God in the end. Point number three, and I'm closing with this, train and trust that his will for your life, for his will for your life, mom. Judges chapter 16, verse 28. Judges 16, verse 28. It says, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two pillar, middle pillars which upon which the house stood and on which it was born up, of the one with his right hand and the other of his left. And we know the end of the story. That temple to that false god fell that day. And with that one failed swoop, more people died in that one moment. God used him to avenge the enemy more in that one moment. But this is, I see Samson here. And he's saying, sin took my, my sight, God. I was imagining while we were worshiping the Lord. I didn't have this in my notes. But here's Samson. He's blinded now. His choices have sent him down a path in an opposite direction of God. And, and because of it, his eyes have been galloped out. He can no longer see. And he's shackled again in bondage. He's shackled. Sin has shackled him. And he's grinding at the wheel. And I can imagine him grinding like this. He's just going in a circle. And it's going on for a long time because his hair's starting to grow. And then he's sitting there and he keeps turning and he can't even see. Could you imagine if your eyes you couldn't even see anymore? And you're just going in a circle and you're working for the enemy and you're enslaved. And you think about your life and the plans that God had for your life. And you have nothing but to do but to think. You have nothing to do but to think and to think how you transgressed God and the step that you took in the wrong direction. And every day you're just sitting there thinking. And I can only imagine that Samson's like, Lord, where did I go wrong? Why did I take that step towards that woman of Timnath? Why did I take that step and go clo close towards the vineyard? Why did I think I had the liberty to go reach and grab that honey out of that dead lion? Why did I do everything that was contrary to your will? How did I end up in the place where I am? But Lord, when it's all said and done, I know that there's enough of you on the inside of me to know this. I am not going to die a Philistine. Yeah. I am not going to die as one that's of the world, but instead yeah. I have the yeah. Spirit of God in me, and I will die as a child of God. Hallelujah. And he went to the Lord, and he cried out to God, and he said, God, give me strength, because in the end I want to know that I live for you. And I don't know what you call success, Mom. But I'm here to tell you what my definition of success is. And there might be a whole lot of other preachers that don't agree with me. And I'm okay with that. But listen to me. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is what I call the hall of fame of the faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And listen to me. Hebrews 11.32. Samson's name is in here. You don't get your name posted in here right, right. for no reason. It says, and what shall I say more for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. I'm here to tell you that when they saw he quit, they quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness. They were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. I don't know what success looks like to you, but Samson is listed in the halls of the heroes of faith. He's in the same paragraph as King David and Gideon. He died an Israelite praying to his God. He didn't die a Philistine. He died a believer, not one that had crossed over to the world. To me, that is success. Good job, Samson's mom. You did your best to dedicate your boy to the Lord. And there were some rough days along the way. But in the end, he called on the name Amen. 